What's up, fam? All right. I want you to think about something real quick. Think about something real quick. All right. What are the gaps in your life? What, what are the gaps in your life? I'm going to take two minutes to tell you a little bit about my story. Think about the gaps in your life. So me, Anthony Flynn, born to a teenage mom in poverty in Memphis, Tennessee. I saw every gang affiliation you could imagine. I saw drugs. I saw crime. I saw a man get shot in his chest and die literally right in front of me as a kid. Two elementary school friends, one is dead three years ago, walking the same streets we walked as kids. One of my other friends is doing life plus 47, gang-related crime. Kicked in the door, boom, tried to rob my man. He ended up having to pull the trigger. Right, so I saw a whole lot of stuff as a kid growing up. And in order for me to get to where I am today and be able to stand before you today, there were some gaps in my life, right? Because the lifestyle that I saw as a kid growing up did not produce the man that you see standing on the stage today. I had to do some things differently from my, from my friends, from my homeboys, from the gangbangers, from my family. My mom was a teenage mom. My dad is a janitor mopping floors right now as I speak to you, right? And so there were some gaps in my life. And in order for me to get out of the hood and get to where I am today, I had to work diligently to close those gaps. All right. And so many years later, fast forward, because of the story and the background that I shared, I hit another wall in my life. I had been successful. I graduated from college, was student of the year in my major, worked for two Fortune 100 companies, had an incredibly successful career, got into the nonprofit space, raised over $30 million. Things were going extremely well for me. And then about three years ago, 2016, March, I hit a wall. Boom! And I, I faced something, y'all. I didn't know how to get out of that situation. I had never seen that before. So here was this kid who came out of the hood who had all of a sudden had all of this success, and then boom, I hit a wall. Mama couldn't bail me out. Dad couldn't bail me out. My pastor couldn't bail me out. My wife couldn't bail me out. I'm struggling trying to figure out what on earth am I going to do to pull myself out of this situation. And then I had somebody say, uh, Ant, I got somebody I think I want to introduce you to online. I'm like, who? Online? I'm thinking my pastor couldn't help me. My mama couldn't help me. My daddy couldn't help me. My wife couldn't help me. All the people around me couldn't help me. Who on earth online could possibly be a solution to this problem I'm having right now? And sure enough, they point me to a guy by the name of Dr. Eric Thomas. So I began listening, March 2016. And, and I listened to one video, and then I listened to two videos, and I'm like, three, four, five. I start listening to the podcast and start following on. I'm like, whoa, this is incredible. God has sent a man through a, a, a screen to actually speak life into me and help me make a shift in my that has ultimately helped me to get to where I am today. So I started following the community of Dr. Eric Thomas. I went to a first conference, and our relationship continued to grow. And let me tell you, everything you're about to hear, everything you see about this man is the real deal. We're talking about, the, if you Google right now, the number one motivational speaker in the entire world, his name's going to come up to the top of the list. The NFL, most sought after speaker. The NBA, most sought after speaker. Major League Baseball, corporate America, colleges and universities. Anybody ever heard of University of Alabama? Nick Saban called him personally. I need you to come help my team. Anybody ever heard of Clemson? Boom, he got the call from Clemson too. So listen, I'm about to get out of your way, but I just want to point something out to you. If you have gaps in your life today, which I'm sure you do because I sat in those same seats, then you want to give him your undivided attention because what you're going to get today will literally be revolutionary and change your life for the rest of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric Thomas. Hey, both on board. How you guys doing? Good. I'm going to come around if y'all don't mind. All right, if you guys can pull out a piece of paper or your phone, like however you take notes. All right, just want to give you a couple notes real quick. All right, first thing I want you guys to write down for me is don't accept the life that's been given to you. All right? One of the challenges that I have, and I'm doing this for free. I work for the NFL experience, and... While I enjoy the process, what they do is they only select a certain group of people to get that experience, right? And I come and speak every year. So I just wanted to hit as many schools as I possibly can 
uh, because when I was your age, and I know you guys are way smarter than me, way deeper than me, but when I was your age, I made some bad choices that eventually caused me to drop out of high school. And there was a pastor um, who, who came, became part of my life when I was 17. And it was so funny, man. I would go to church, and he just felt like I was going to be somebody. And he would just tell me every week, like, you, you need to get your GED. You need to get out of the streets of Detroit. You need to go to college. And I was like, bro, I ain't trying to be funny, but my mom got pregnant with me at 17 years old. I don't even know who my father is. Like, in my family, we don't do school. Like, my mom, you know, barely finished high school when she got pregnant with me. My uncles, I got three uncles. All of them went to prison. Nobody graduated. My grandma had 14 kids. Only two graduated from high school. I'm like, yo, we don't do college. You know what I'm saying? Um, but every week, man, when I go to church, he keep asking me every week. Like, he had, a, like, amnesia. My man be like, did you get your GED? I was like, I told you last week I ain't get my GED. Next week, did you get your GED? I was like, no, I ain't get my GED. The next week, did you get your GED? I'm like, no, I didn't get my GED. He was like, yo, get your GED. Get out of Detroit. And um, I remember probably about three, four months in, his wife, she came up to me and was like, did you get your GED? I was like, no, ma'am. And she would give me a hug and say, I love you. Uh, she'd give me a kiss. She'd say, baby. And she didn't call me by my name. She'd say, baby. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, did you get your GED? I said, no, ma'am. She said, get your GED and go to college. So I'm here because I want to help somebody, right? And my biological father, I found out when I got older, like we met when I was 30. I found out he dropped out. I didn't know who my grandfather was when he died. I found out he dropped out. My grandfather had like five kids by five different women. My father had like five kids by five different women. And, um, you know, I made up in my mind. I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I knew, like, I, I don't want to be what my father was. So I'm going to give you guys just a couple things, and I'm going to get out your hair. But the first thing I want you to write down is do not accept the life that was given to you. Right? I want you to write your own story. And that's going to be hard. I'm just going to be real. It's going to be hard because for a lot of you, like, you're not, you're not whether you want to admit it or not, and at this age, you probably can't admit it, but you are more concerned about being in the in crowd than you are creating your own story. Now, I'm going to do something real quick, right, because I want to show you something, right? I'm going to show you something because ignorance, you don't know, right? Um, if, if, uh, if I could ask the principal, if you could stand for me, please. It's principal here. Can you stand? How you doing, ma'am? Good. Good. So let me just ask you a question. What, what high school did you attend? Detroit High School. Uh, was that here in Atlanta? No, South So how big was your high school? It was a very small high school. It was about 112. Good. 112? Yeah. Good. Small class. All right. So tell me of those hundred and some students in your class, like, like, like weekly, you know, monthly, how many of those people do you uh, hang out with or stay in contact with? Sir, can you stand for me, please? Good. What high school did you attend? Westlake. Westlake. What, what city was that? Atlanta. Atlanta. How, how big was the school? Uh, 2,000. About 2,000. Of the 2,000, how many, how many are you running with weekly? How many are you running with monthly? Uh, we do three Good. Three weeks. So you said, how many did you say? None. None. And you said out of 2,000? Four? Good. Just want to, I want to show y'all something real quick. So the person you hanging out with not showing off for, like for real, the person that you, for, like you not taking school serious because you, you in the clique, you with the crew that you hang with. So you're doing what they do. You're not really doing what you do. I want, let me say, say this to you. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you won't even know the person you sit next to. I'm just keeping it 100 with like, we, I can do this whole, I do this whole school with all the adults that's in this joint, and I'm telling you, ain't nobody going to say if they went to school with 2,000 that they hang with 10. I'm just being real. Like, I, so, so the person you putting on for that you giving all this energy to is wasted because in 10 years, you're not even going to know who they are. You're not going to know where they are. Like, out of the 2,000 students, do you know where 1,000 of them are? You know what I'm saying? 200 of them. Do you know where a hundred of them are? So for, I just I, like I, I want to put it in perspective that you are put you giving a lot of energy to a person you're not even gonna know ten years from now. You're trying to be cool for somebody you don't even know. So 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 let me tell you what happened in my life. Unfortunately, 
There are going to be people that are, are going to be there for you. And for whatever reason, when you come to school every day, you don't think about them. So let me tell you what happened when I dropped out of high school. Crazy. I don't know how they do it in the ATL, but in Detroit, when you get kicked out legally, you have to go to the school or you'll go to jail and you got to do like an exit interview. So you don't get to just leave, leave. You got to go back. If you're a minor, you got to go back up to the school. So y'all know the drill. All my little homies I'm hanging out with, ain't nothing positive happening. Guess who called me to say, and, and they had to find me. Guess who found me to go back up to the school to do the exit interview? Guess who was the person that found me and took me back up to the school? Who? I can't hear you. Pastor? Man, I wish. I, I wasn't really running with my man like that. I was a high school dropout by the time I got to him. By the time I got, police? Nope, not the police. My mama. You feel me? My mom found out where I was on the block, took me up to the school. Now, y'all got to see this. My mom from Chicago. My grandma had 14 kids, 11 females, three guys, right? So my mom, pregnant at 17, manages to graduate top 10 of her class. My mom had to fight because back in the 70s, you got pregnant, you couldn't, you couldn't march. That was an embarrassment to the school. You couldn't march. So my mom fought by herself because my grandma didn't finish school, fought. And, and graduated and went to the prom. I got a pick of my looking good. Mom pregnant at the prom. So my mom had to come up to the, let me tell you something. Worst day of my life, bruh. Just young and stupid. Worst day of my life. My mom come up there, principal come out. They bring out my grades from like, I'm talking about like back in the, <laughs> I, I can't explain it, but it was like my whole record, elementary, middle, because I grew up in Detroit. They had all my records right there. I watched my mom for the first time in my life cry. I saw my, my mom ain't never begged a man for nothing. I saw my mom beg. She, what, who, who, who was she begging? For what? So I could stay in school. My man showed my mom my grades. Middle school, he didn't want this. High school, he don't want this. You want him to be in school. He don't want to be here. And I remember we walked out that hall, y'all. I'm, I'm 48 years old. I didn't travel the world. He said it, NFL, whatever. I've done it. Dubai, Australia, I've done it. I, when, the worst time of my life, I walked down that hall with my mom on the way out. I was homeless. I wasn't even living at the crib. My mom didn't say nothing to me. She ain't say nothing to me. We walk, it was the longest walk I've ever had in my life. When we went outside, we opened up that door and we got into the parking structure, my mom dropped one tear. My mom said, I, I, they told me I should have had an abortion. They told me I was ruining my life having you. They told me I was smart enough to go to college and I didn't go to college because of you. And, and this is what you do to me? What did, I, what did I ever do to you? I didn't raise you like this. I took you to programs. I sat there and read with you at night. What kind of, but you know, you know why I dropped out of school? My boys, they was all high school dropouts, selling dope, acting a fool, so I'm running with them. But, the, but, but, but when I went to jail, when I got caught with my boy with dope in the, in the whip, ain't none of my homies come up to the jail. Ain't none of my homies came up to the jail. Who? None of my homies. No, nobody was there for me, but who was always there? Some of y'all in here clowning for your boy sitting next to you that you're not going to know 10 years from now. And I finally got my stuff together like the pastor told me. I was about 18, almost 19, I got my GED. Ladies, be careful who you're running with. I started going to church. It, I, I turned my life around by doing something positive, like going to a positive environment. I started going to church, and I met a young lady in church. And I remember we started dating. And I'll never forget, I went to her crib. She's like, my mom not here. I need you to come real quick. I was like, bet. <laughs> Got to the crib. I was trying to go, go inside. She's like, no, you don't go in. I'm like, don't go in. She said, your mom wasn't here. What are, we, what are we doing? We about to talk? It's like, Bible study or something? <laughs> and she was like, nope, sit on the porch. I'll be outside. I was like, all right, cool. She came out. She was like, you love me? And I was like, what? I was like, yo, for real, I'm like, for real, I ain't trying to be funny. But I was like, where did that come from? It's like out of nowhere. What you mean? She's like, no, no, for real. She was serious. Like, she had a serious look on her face. Like, no, I'm serious. Do you love me? And I was like, yeah, you know I do. I mean, I'm 18. As much as 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, as much as I can, yeah. And she was like, all right, if you really love me like you say you do, I just got, she pulled it out. I, never, I didn't never get one myself, but she pulled out an acceptance letter to college. She was a year younger than me. She was like, look, I'm going to college. I got accepted. And if you don't come to college with me, I'm breaking up with you. Bruh, I went to night school, bruh. <laughs> Your boy went to night school for about three to six months. I'm studying the pre-GED. Killing the game. Ladies, do me a favor. Don't lower your standards. Make them come up to them. Don't lower your standards. Keep your standards high. Don't lower your standards. Keep your standards high. I'm being real. I'm just being real. And, and bros, if I was you, I'm just being real, fellas. If I was you, I wouldn't get with no chicken heads. I'm just being real. When I played ball, when I, play, when I did play football and I ran track, I never wanted to run against a dude that was weak. I wanted to run against the best. To, to me, it didn't mean nothing if I could beat the dude that was whack. Like, I, want, I wanted to, when I, I was quick, I wanted to run against the dude that was the fastest in school. I, when we would go to other schools, high school, so don't, don't hang out with weak people. You feel me? Don't hang out with weak people. Why? Because weak people ain't going to push you. They're not going to make you better. They're going to make you stay in the environments you're in. So my girl was like, yo, I'm going to college, and if you don't go, I'm breaking up with you. I studied for three to six months, passed my GED. I got in a second. When her mom took her, I was in a van with her. And after our freshman year, I was like, well, you married me. I'm just being real. I went to college. I was like, whoa, these dudes ain't capping jokes. They ain't clowns like in high school. They ain't selling dope. They ain't in gangs. These dudes up here talking about my boy Derek, Derek Green told me he was going to be a lobbyist when we was young. My man in D.C. like working for the senator. The Kane boys from Bermuda told me they was going to be lawyers. I went to Bermuda about 10 years ago. We go into court. My man got a wig on. I'm like, what? they like, all rise? I'm like, that's my boy. I ain't about to stand up. All rise? i like, I went to school, ate ramen noodles with my man. They was like, all rise? Like, he ain't your boy right now. He the judge. I'm like, oh, my bad. My boy Puck, he said he was going to be a pastor. He in Tennessee, he a pastor right now. My boy Eric Walsh said he was going to be a doctor. He owns his own practice in California. That's the difference when I was in the hood. Everybody was talking about girls, sex, drugs, fighting. When I got to college, cats was talking about changing the world. They was wearing suits on Tuesday morning for breakfast talking about apartheid. Plessy versus Ferguson. Brown versus Board of Education. I'm like, what? Never heard anything of it like my life. They got briefcases. See, when you start hanging around people who read, you start reading. You're still competitive. It's just a different kind of competition. So after my freshman year, I was like, well, you married me. Everybody was like, why are you marrying her? Nah, I'm like, yo, one of these doctor dudes going to get her. One of these engineers. I better scoop her now before she starts thinking. You know what I'm saying? She's still in love with me. About four years from now, she might be in love with him. I'm like, let's go. Right? Got my GED. Went to college with her. Took me 12 years, but I got my four-year degree. And the reason why it took me 12 years, because I played in middle school. I played in high school. I played in elementary school. And let me tell y'all something. I ain't mad at you. But one day, bro, you're going to wake up, and all your, you're going to be in your dream. I was in my dream, y'all. I was married to my high school sweetheart. I was in college, historically black college. I, I'm talking about all oh, basketball game. I mean, we was having a blast, but I was going to school and failing. I was where I always wanted to be, but I wasn't prepared when I got there. And a lot of y'all, you're going to wake up and you're going to be exactly where you want to be. Imagine me being one of the top motivational speakers in the world and I'm struggling because my vocabulary is weak. Imagine me having a gift to speak and being sweet, but when I get up, I can't hardly read. Why? Because I played. I played in elementary school. I played in middle school. I played in high school. And when God finally gave me my opportunity, I wasn't ready for it. So it took me 12 years to get a four-year degree. But it's all good. It's not how you start the race. It's how you finish it that counts. Because after getting that 12 year to four, somebody was like, E, now you just learn how to study and learn. Don't quit now. And I went and got the master's degree. And I hate school. And I went and got the PhD. Hate school. And I don't even use, people, what's your name? E.T., I thought you had a PhD. I do. I don't even use that. I only use my doctor when I'm getting my check. When they call, how much you charge? I'm like, you know I got a doctor's degree, don't you? That's going to extra zero me out. <laughs> you feel me? I wrote three books. I'm going to need that extra zero, please. So I'm not smart. I don't even like school. But sometimes in life, put this down, sometimes in life you have to do what you don't want to do so you can live like you want to live. Sometimes you got to do what you don't want to do. I don't like school. I ain't like writing no papers. I ain't like doing no research. I ain't like doing no homework. And unlike y'all, I grew up in Michigan, Chicago originally. So this time is like negative four. 
nine, ten inches of snow. I was tripping yesterday. They was like, they closing the schools down. I was like, what, what what's happening? <laughs> like, what, what we close? It's raining. <laughs> I was like, I was a little confused. I was like, it's raining outside. It's like, no, this is Atlanta. This, the roads ain't ready for it. I was like, oh, okay. Because in Detroit, it's 12 inches of snow. You still got to go to school. It's, it's six degrees. You still got to go to school. Why? Because if you shut down because of that, you're going to be shut down all January, <laughs> all February, all March, right? Because it snows all the time. So I need y'all to do me a huge favor. Okay, three things I need you to do. Number one, I told you about my girl. I need you to be careful of the environment you're in and the people you're running with. And I'm not mad at you, but just make sure that the people you're with are taking you where you want to go. So if you're trying to go to jail, keep running with my man. That's where you're trying to go. If you're trying to die early, go for it. I'm saying, if that's what you're trying to do, you're trying to get pregnant before you're 17, keep fooling with my man. I, I, I don't know what you're trying to do. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. But I'm saying that the group of people you're hanging with you better be careful who you're hanging with because they're taking you somewhere. And I'm hoping you they're taking you where you want to go. So watch this. Tell you when my career changed and I became a millionaire. I'll never forget my man Dan Gilbert. Anybody ever heard the name Dan Gilbert before? Who's Dan Gilbert? Anybody. It ain't no trick question. NBA. Yeah, what, what specifically about the NBA? Yeah, he owns a team called the Cleveland Cavaliers. Right? So I'll never forget, I was, I was with my church and we was out it was like Christmas time, and he texted me. He's like, yo, E, what you doing tomorrow? I'm like, I don't know. What's up? He said, we, I gotta, I'm doing a lunch with 30 men around the world, and Warren Buffett is going to be, uh, he's going to be leading the meet now. I'm like, I ain't doing nothing. I don't know what, whatever I was doing, I ain't doing it. To be able to sit down with the richest man in the world, I'm like, I ain't doing jack. Next day I got there, I'm going to be real with y'all. It was rough. Because it was the richest man in the world. And I know they was all white guys for the most part. It was about two, two bros in the room. So I didn't know if I should wear my hat and my J's or if I should wear a suit. And I was like, I ain't going to sell out. I will wear a new pair of jeans, though. You know what I'm saying? And I put on some J's I hadn't wore before. You know, you know how you got, like, the J's just in the box sitting there. I was like, I'm going to get some new J. I put the new hat on. And the new when you want to succeed is bad, you want a brief shirt. And I went in that room. Guys, listen to me very closely. Number one, be careful who you hang out with, because who you hang out could change the world. And when I left that room with Warren Buffett, I said, E, whatever you do, take notes. I was taking notes, bro. Pay attention to everything he says. Listen to what my man is saying. And when you leave, I want you to do exactly what he tells you to do. So the first thing you got to do is you got to put yourself, listen to me, in the right environments around the right people, because those right people can help you to go where you need to go. So of course now I'm working for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Starting to work for Brian. Brian got an organization. I'm going to his high schools, right? They sending me gear all the time. I, I never forget my uh, t when I went to the playoff, to the um, not the playoffs, but the finals. My wife was like, "We're going to the game." I was like, "Yeah." Um, Dan was like, "Yo, get in a private jet. We'll fly you in." My wife was like, "She, you know, she hood. She's like, I ain't getting in no jet with three people. That might come down." She's like, "I need to be in the big aircraft." So I was like, don't worry about it, we'll drive. She's like, where are we sitting? I was like, I don't know, but he on the team. So we shouldn't be in the nosebleeds. My, my peeps hitting me up like, E, E, I see you, I see you on TV. I'm like, what you mean you see me on TV? They're like, yo, they were showing Brian, you was right behind the. So you know what happened when you're on TV right behind Brian. Now companies are calling you to speak and you can charge more. Because you're not just at the game, but whenever the camera on my man, you own it. So when Alabama called me and we're doing ESPN, Kobe speaking one day, I'm speaking the next day. Bro, the person you hang out with could change your life forever. Who you hanging out with? Who you running with? You running with people going to jail? I'm not against that. I just know when I got caught with my boy with the dope and we went to jail. We didn't go to prison. We went to jail for a couple days. I realized then it was a toilet in the middle of the... I knew then, this ain't, I, this ain't my, I can't do this. <laughs> it was dudes like actually using the bathroom in front of people. I was like, bro, I don't care if I'm in here two days, four days, five days, I'm holding, ev I'm holding everything. They was bringing in nasty food. Dudes was like, let me get yours. I'm like, here, you can have it. They was eating it like it was McDonald's. You laughing, but they had gotten accustomed to being prisoners. They got accustomed to their freedom being taken. I went one time and was like, yo, this ain't for me. I ain't meant to be, I'm not meant to be bunking with no dude forever. I ain't mad at nobody. But that ain't, I'm not meant to be telling, bedtime, me and my man telling stories for 30 years together. Top bunk, I'm in the bottom bunk. I'm like, that ain't my life. 
I got married at 19. I've been sleeping with my girl since I was 19 years old. I wasn't meant to be in prison. I wasn't meant to miss uh, Thanksgiving with my grandma. I wasn't meant to miss uh, uh, Fourth of July. I would, that's, that, that's not the life I was meant for. I was meant to have my freedom. I was meant to travel the world. I got a passport. What's your life meant for? And how important is your life to you? How much do you value it? This is your time, guys. I used to tell my kids when they was in school, this is your job. This is your only job. What you're doing right now is going to determine where you go next. And where you go next is going to determine the rest of your life. You ain't going to be a teenager before a few years. Watch this. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. That's seven years. It seems like it's going to last forever, but it's not. You'll be a teenager for seven, te seven years. You'll be an adult for the rest of your life. But the decisions you make in those seven years will determine what the rest of your life looks like. So what do you want? It's up to you. You can be whatever you want to be. You can have whatever you want. It's, your, it's up to you. I turned it around. I went from eating out of trash cans and living in abandoned buildings to being the number one motivational speaker in the world. Can you count on you? I woke up day, one day and was like, with a real Eric Thomas, please stand up. Go to school. You ain't stupid. Go to school. Learn. I woke up one day and was like, yo, E, you got a mouthpiece. God bless you with a gift. You need to use that gift so you can eat and your family can eat and your family's family can eat. Now we got a solar company. Now we doing real estate. Now my son is working with NBA players and NFL players. Now my daughter, she's a sophomore, I mean, a, a junior in college, she got her own business. My father wasn't there for me. My grandfather wasn't there for him. I, I broke the cycle. I changed it all. I can count on me. I get up every morning at 3 o'clock. I put a video on Instagram every day. I got over a million subscribers. Guys, I can count on me. Can you count on you? How many of y'all, be honest. If you really tried, you could be an A student if you wanted to. Let me see your hand. Be honest. You, if you wanted to. Good. Hands down. How many of you can honestly say you're giving you? We're not talking about no teacher. This ain't about no teacher. This ain't about no school. How many of you can honestly say you're giving you 100%? Be real. Every class, every assignment. How many of y'all can say you're giving 90%? Good. How many of you, come on, how many of you can say I'm probably giving 80% of my effort? Be honest. Good. How many of you say 70%? I'm probably giving 70%. How many of you honestly, I know how smart I am, I'm probably giving 50%. Let me see your hands. You, 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 you can't even count on you. Come on, I'm, I'm just saying, you can get A's and you're not getting them. How many of y'all, for real, if you really try, you can knock out that little SAT or ACT and get you a scholarship to go to college. For real, for real, you know you can do it. Let me see your hands. You had ancestors who was just as smart as you, if not smarter, and they didn't have a chance. If you was black, you couldn't go to school at once, once a part of time in America. You could get lynched for going to school. You, if you got caught going to school, you could lose your life. You could go to prison. And now y'all got a chance to do it and you ain't doing it. So I need you to do me a favor. When you leave, this ain't got nothing to do with the Atlanta public school system. Let's be real. This has nothing to do with the Atlanta public school system. This has everything to do with you. And I want y'all to do me a huge favor. How many days we got left in school? Come on now. You, come on, I'm, you coming every day. Now you should know that. That ain't... That ain't like a, that ain't a quiz. You know what I'm saying? It should be, school should be like prison. You should have your calendar on the wall. And you should be like, wow, 45 days left. 100 days left. You should know that, right? How many we got left? 76? Good, 76. I like that. Watch this. We got 76 left. Make me a vow. E. If I ain't sick, like for real, for real, I'm making a commitment to be here and be 100% on all 76 of those days. Let me see your hand. Only those who are willing to do it. Let me see your hands. I'm not going to. 76, E. I got it, E. 76. All right, number two, E. When I come, I'm willing to put forth 120% effort. I didn't say an A. I didn't say a B. I said 120% effort. Let me see your hands. Good. Now watch this. How many of you guys, if you could take school serious, and you knew by taking school serious and going to college, getting a trade, whatever, that you could put your mom in a different neighborhood. Let me see your hands. Hands down. Excuse me, I want to ask my principal another question, please. If, if I went to college, I took care of my business, would I be able to put myself in a position financially, especially as a millennial in 2019, would I be able to put myself in a position where I could be a blessing to my mama? Good, and I could be able to bless my mama financially? 
show y'all. I need you to see it. So you have the opportunity while you're playing with your friends, you have an opportunity to put your mama in a house. You have an opportunity to give your mama the keys to whatever car she wants to drive. And then if you handle your business, what's your name, bro? Yeah. Tanari. Tanari. And they get rid Tanari. It's so easy, bro. It's so easy. So what happens is I go to Michigan State, right? I get a master's degree and a PhD. I work for the football team. I work for the basketball team. They know me on campus. So what happens is they call it nepotism. <laughs> so no matter what grades my kid get in high school, it don't matter. No matter what SAT score my kids get, they can go where? They can go to Michigan State University. Because what happens on the application, it asks a question. Did you have any family members that attended here? We did. Who is your father? Dr. Eric Thomas. I'll never forget, my wife got diagnosed with MS. My daughter's sophomore year in high school. I don't know what happened, but my daughter and her mom were so close that my daughter went from getting A's to straight C's and D's. De devastate, devastated her. I went to my daughter her senior year. I was like, boo, I ain't trying to be funny, but you can't go to college with this. And my daughter, my, she grinds. I was like, I know your mom's sick. I know it hurts you, but with these grades, you're not going to be able to go to college. Now, what my daughter don't know that I know is that <laughs> they don't use your senior year when they're deciding if you go to college or not. They look at your sophomore year and your junior year, but she don't know that. So I'm like, boo, you need to get it together. Her senior year, all A's. When it was time to go to college, I went up to the university and knocked on the door for the person who made the decision who getting in. He's not here right now. He's in the meeting. I said, oh, tell him E.T. came by to see him. On my way out, he comes out to meet. What's up, E.T.? I was like, how you doing? He said, hey, E., we were just watching one of your videos. Oh, hey, I appreciate the other day when the recruit came up. <laughs> appreciate you going by and seeing the family. No problem. How can I help you, E.T.? Oh, I just put my daughter's application in. Oh, have a good day. I said, no, I just put my daughter. Hey, E., have a good day. Just tell her to watch the computer. Her acceptance letter is coming. My daughter got her acceptance letter. It said, your grades were bad, your SAT score was all right, so we're going we to enroll you on a provisional basis. Based on what your test says, it says, you have some learning disabilities, so we want you to go by and see a tutor. I was so geeked, I showed my daughter, I said, they said you got a learning disability. I know she a fighter. My daughter graduated, shh, I'm sorry, it takes 120 credits to graduate. Her freshman year, she had 40. Her sophomore year, she had 40. Her junior year, she had 30. I looked the other day, she had a cap and ground on. She graduated in three years. Not, not only will you be able to bless the generation ahead of you, you'll be able to bless the generation behind you. So when I speak at Alabama and I meet Nick Saban, and we kick it, I'll say, Nick, I need you to do me a favor. I'm going to meet some kids who are going to want to come to the university. I'm, I'm going to need us to be close. I'm going to need you to give me one or two kids. In. It's easy. It's easy. When you start doing the right thing the right way, it's easy. Michigan State, I'm going to need a hookup. I just took a group of kids from Zanesville, a terrible school. All these kids should be in prison. It's a K through 12, terrible, only school like it in the, and I took all of them to Ohio State. My boy Braxton Miller, we came up, took them on a tour, took them out to eat, gave them an experience of a lifetime. It's easy. When you fail, it's easy. When you start succeeding, it's easy. When you, when you fail, it's easy. My father dropped out. My grandfather dropped out. I dropped out. It's easy. But when I got my PhD, I went to Michigan State. My son went to Michigan State. My daughter went. When you're doing bad, it's easy. When you're doing good, it's easy. It just, e either way, don't let nobody fool you. It's not hard to do good. It's not, it's not, it's no harder to do good than it is to do bad. It's easy. Once you make up in your mind what you want, it's easy. And so what I want y'all to do for me, you told me you could get A's. I need you to be in favor. I need you to prove them wrong. Because they, <laughs> they don't think you could get A's. What do they think about you? Just be real. What do they think about you? B's. I don't, I don't know if they think that. It doesn't matter what they think, but I don't think that's what they think. I don't think when they, look, when I get on a plane, you think, my son got on a plane the other day, first class. What'd they tell you, son? They told my man he put his bag in the wrong place. 
Your, your bag must be in the wrong place because you're definitely not flying what? You think when I get on the plane, they think I got a PhD? <laughs> you think when they look at me, but it don't matter what they think, but I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm a, it, like you, it ain't a certain look for a PhD. This just grind. This is just what grind look like. This is what average skill but phenomenal will look like. This is what it look like when you ain't smart, but you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. This is what it looked like when a professor at Michigan State told me, you, you don't think critically enough to get a PhD. You can't write a dissertation. I'm like, ooh, I get it. Where you from, people are smart. Where I'm from, we grind. So I went to Michigan State Library, and I went to the third floor, and I read 40 dissertations. So I found the one that looked like something I could write. And I studied that joker like we study folks on the street. And I studied it for two, three, four weeks. And I was like, yes, I can do it. And boom, I turned that thing around. So everybody said with me, average skill, phenomenal will. Average skill, phenomenal will. So you don't have to have phenomenal skill. You just got to have phenomenal. Come on, you ain't got to have phenomenal skill. You just need to have phenomenal as my boy come up here, listen to me very close. Y'all got to hear me. Y'all got, y'all got, y'all got that dog. So do me a favor. Y'all fight on the street. How many of y'all been in a fight before? Let me see your hand. Come on. You fight on the street, but when your teacher give you a math test, now you want to punk out. Somebody tell you to write a five-page paper. Now you scared. But you will fight for your life on the street, but you won't fight a paper. You won't fight an, a, a, an exam. You won't fight a standardized test. Don't back up on no tests. You approach the test the same way you approach somebody who approached you on the streets. You don't quit. You don't give up. You don't run. So why are you running from a paper? Why are you running from a quiz? Why are you running from an exam? Why are you running from a state test? Stop running. Stop running and face it. And you overcome that just like you overcame everything. Let me tell you something. When I found out you could get paid to speak, I'm like, you can make money for talking? I would do this for free. You mean to tell me Tony Robbins get 100 G's to talk? You mean to tell me Les Brown making 50 to 100 grand talking? I'm like, let me add him. Give me the mic. They like, but E, you didn't grow up with a two-parent a two parent background. E, but you dropped out. I said, bro, you mean to tell me I got to compete with somebody who grew up with two parents? You mean to tell me I got to compete with somebody whose parents was rich? You mean to tell me that that's who I'm going up against? I ate out of trash cans. I slept in abandoned buildings. When I put forth for 120% effort, can't nobody stop me. And I ain't bragging, but put my name in it. I didn't get here off being smart. I didn't get here being talented. I got here off that dog. I got that dog. I got that grind. And whatever I put my mind to, four-year degree, master's degree, PhD, whatever I put my mind to, I can do it. How many of y'all feel like you, whatever you put your mind to, you can do it? Come on, be real. How many of y'all got that dog? You already grew up, like, you know what I'm saying, with some challenges, and you've been able to overcome them challenges. Let me see your hands. How many of y'all grandma got that dog? Let me see your hand. Your grandma a fighter. Let me see your hand. Your grandma still fight. How many of y'all grandma still work? Raise your hand. Grandma still putting in that work. How many of y'all moms still work? How many of y'all single parent homes and your mom holding it down? Come on, you come from generations of folk that got that dog, and now y'all gonna get soft on me? Y'all gonna get weak on me? This, look, this is the wealthiest generation we ever had. Y'all the most privileged generation we ever had. Y'all have more stuff than any generation ever had. It's time to produce. It's time to put up. If Rosa Parks could put up, you should be able to put up. If Megar Evers could put up, you ought to be able to put up. If Martin Luther King could put up, Malcolm X could put up. Come on. Betty Shabazz could put up. You ought to be able to Marcus Garvey could put up. Nat Turner could put up. Under the conditions, Booker T. Washington, the Tuskegee Airmen, if they can put up under all those circumstances, and you got what you got now, Look at this school. You think our people went to this kind of schools 100 years ago? You got more than any generation has ever had. You up by 20 in the game ain't even started. Don't you lose. That didn't gave you a 20-point advantage. You have more than any generation we had. Y'all was born with a 20-point lead. You about to blow a 20-point lead? So when y'all get back, come on, say I am. Whatever I say I am. I am whatever I say I am, and I can do 
whatever I say I can do. Come on, I am, I am, whatever I say I am. I'm not what they say I am. I am whatever I say I am. And I can do whatever I say I can do. And I can have. No, let's not go there. And my mama can have whatever she want to have. Because I'll do whatever I got to do to make sure mama have whatever she want to have. I mean that. Don't play with me. I mean that. When you go back to class, that's what I want you to think about. When you take that exam, say it's either my mama live where she want to live or somebody else's mama. I'm going to make sure my mama eat. I'm not playing on no tests no more. My mama in California right now, right now, and I paid for her to get out of the winter to be there right now. No excuses. No excuses. No excuses. Just adjustments. No excuses. Just adjustments. No excuses. Just adjustments, because excuses going to keep my mama in her same position. No excuses, only adjustments. Jurors, where you at? You got the mic? All right. How y'all feeling? Y'all all right? Got a whole lot of time, but uh, what have we learned so far? No excuses. What does that mean? No, no, no. Don't, don't just, don't just regurgitate what he said. What does it mean for you personally? No more procrastination. How many people give their all in school right now? Okay. I had a problem because I couldn't tie, I couldn't tie the stuff that I was learning in school to stuff I knew I wanted out of life. Am I the only one? Like my teacher's teaching me something, but for some reason in my head, I can't see how I'm ever going to use it. Am I the only person that thought like that? So here's what, here's, and, and just kind of living, um, vocabulary is never my thing. English was never, I just wrote my second book. I just wrote my second book, but I don't ever remember getting over a D in any class that I ever had in English. But I didn't realize how much I needed English until it was time to write a book. But did you know that um, your level of vocabulary definitely has a tie to your likelihood of going to prison? Is that true? I'm talking about the vocabulary test. You, you, ain't, you ain't really on that right now. But do you believe that that is a tie to your likelihood of going to prison? No? This is a study that they did. They found a study that most of the prisoners that are in jail have a between a third and fifth grade reading level, meaning they just don't know all the words, which makes kind of, it makes sense perfectly. Because if you don't, the smaller your vocabulary is, the smaller the world becomes to you. If I'm having a conversation, it's not about using big words. It's not about using big words, but it's about being able to understand. So the smaller your, your vocabulary, the smaller your world is. It's like looking at, a, looking at the world through a peephole. I'm on the other side trying to tell you how big the world is, but this is how big you can see. But it kind of makes sense now because if you can't express what's going on in your head and on your heart, you'll probably act it out. Most people who have anger issues can't find the words to say to get themselves out of that situation, so they do what? It's making a little sense? If you can't find the words, if you can't find the words, there are going to be so certain conversations you're just not allowed to be in. So if your world is this big, you really only need a cell 10 by 10 to live in because that's all the space you really need. But I didn't understand how much English was needed until it was time to write a book and I had to pay all this money to an editor. I didn't understand anybody good at math, anybody not good at math, like you really struggle with math. It's vital. But outside of all the things that you learn, there's going to be a roadblock in your way and you gotta try to get through it. And that's all these problems are in school. Getting the grade, I'm just asking you to get the grade. Do y'all know the smarter you become, the more information you can retain and give back to, 
in a test, y'all know the teacher gives you the answer. You got to remember it for a little while and give it back. Does that make sense? Why is school so hard? Somebody help me out. The teacher gives you the answer. Am I right? They don't just ask you questions they ain't give you the answers to. They give you the answer, ask you to hold it for a little while, and just give it back when I ask you the question to a test. Why is school so hard? Say it again. Distractions. Based on people we're not going to know in 10 years. Ain't that crazy? Why is school so hard? Somebody help me out. Pardon? Your attention span? I got some of the same issues. I want to give you all a formula to help me. So I, I, have, I have a slight learning disability where I don't know if you all like me, but when I'm at the top of a page, by the time I get to the bottom, I'll have forgotten what I read at the top. You like that? And it's not that I, I don't understand the words. It's just I'm reading, and about in the middle, my mind starts to wander. And then I find myself at the bottom of the page, and I'm like, okay, what is the top? It, it just, I have a learning disability. But like he said, I grind. Because I equate my education, the things that I know, to my success. And my success is tied to my mom's success. And I could not let these bills beat up on my mom without doing something about it. If you were in the street, you're walking with your mom, and it was like four people. They got beef with you, you got beef with them. It's you and your mom. And they start to jump your mom. At what point do you stop fighting? Never? At what point do we give up like, oh, mom, you on your own. I can't. They got me. This one got me. I At what point do you stop fighting? Okay. This is what I saw. This is what I saw. Check this out. And this is, this is all seriousness. So you win. But I, it's, it's, it's nice to say, but watch this. Watch this. When I was growing up, when I was growing up, um, I saw my mom struggle. Sometimes the lights are on, sometimes they're off. I remember I went to the light switch, flipped the light switch, it didn't come on. And I'm like, yo, mom, the light switch is broke. I think we got um, some type of issue here. And she said, nah, the lights will be on tomorrow. I was like, well, mom, my show doesn't come on tomorrow. It comes on today. Back in the day, you couldn't record it. Like, it comes on that day. There was no reruns. And she said, well, it's, uh, it's going to be on tomorrow. And at that point, I realized how hard my mom had to work to make sure by the time I get to that light switch, it works. So I saw, I saw, the, I saw my mom struggle with these bills nonstop. And I saw life beating up on my mom. Anybody ever see that? How life is beating up on some of your parents, some of your loved ones. You ever see that? I saw that. And I told myself, I told myself I would not let, I would not let life continue to do this to the one I love. Look how selfish I was. I was telling them in the other school, my mom would work all day to bring home groceries and then cook the food and then prepare the plate and let me eat. And No, I would eat, but then I get an attitude if I have to wash the dishes. How many of you ever did that? Like, Mom, come on. When we put it in that context, isn't that selfish? I would hate, I would hate, I would hate when my mom told me to clean my room because I clean the best I can. I was never really good at that. Like, I'd take something from over here and put it over there. It's not necessarily cleaner, but that's just my style. And I would get so upset. But then I realized that my mom struggled every single day. I'm talking about food stamps, unemployment, all this kind of stuff. She struggled every single day to make sure I had a room to go to. She struggled every day to make sure I had a room to clean. But I would get an attitude, guess when? When she, when she asked me to clean it. Ain't that crazy? How many people can give our parents a little more effort? And some of you don't see how... Your study habits in school are, it's breaking, breaking your parents' heart. Because they do all this stuff to make sure you have an education, and you throw it away. And for some reason, you don't see how doing well in school will prevent you from paying sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in college. Did y'all know that? The better you do in high school, the less you got to pay in college. And the, anybody getting a scholarship? 
What's your scholarship? One of y'all. What's your scholarship? Say it again. Purdue, how much is the scholarship for? How much is the scholarship for? Yeah. Full ride? Do you know somebody in this school is probably going to go to Purdue and pay about how much? Say it again. Well, half of nothing is nothing. But if you go to four years to Purdue, how much is Purdue, education at Purdue? How much is that to go to for four, for four years? About 50000 a year? For four years, 200000 You got a full ride? You mean to tell me you applied yourself in high school and now you're going to be $200,000 up on somebody that just want to go to Purdue? And for some reason, we don't see how we can take that $200,000 and buy our, our mom a house. But we refuse to really give it our all in school. Meaning, you care more about your friends and your comfortability than you do taking care of the one you say you love. How many of us can see how selfish we've been? It's selfish. If you don't produce, if you don't win. I went to college, and my mom gave me a cell phone. Now, the phone wasn't on all the time. And we had minutes, so she urged me not to use my phone. Y'all don't know nothing about this. You couldn't use it until after 9. My mom gave me this cell phone, and she said, you're going to need a cell phone. I thought I was so cool, had the ringtones and all that kind of stuff. I know y'all don't do ringtones like that no more, but that was cool back then. But she paid my bill as, as often as she could. And when she gave me that cell phone, I made myself a promise. I said, one day, I'm going to make sure my mom doesn't have a cell phone. Because when I was 16, a cell phone bill. Because when I was 16, I didn't have a cell phone bill. So one of my, one of my immediate goals when I was an adult, pay my mom's what? Y'all should have seen it. It was her birthday, and I bought her a cell phone. And she's like, oh, it's an iPhone. It's dope. I love it. This is like when I first started my business. I was working at the Cheesecake Factory as a server, and then I started my business. Gave her the phone. She said, oh, my gosh, I love it. I've been wanting one of these iPhones. I said, Mom, here's the cool part about this. You will never, ever have to pay another phone bill again because I put this phone on my plane. You'll never have to pay another phone bill again. How much y'all think a phone bill is? Sixty, seventy dollars, a hundred dollars a month. But I knew, I knew I was in debt. I had to pay that back. Y'all know my next goal? I remember, I remember, I remember having um, having a shelter, having a house that I didn't have to pay rent on. And remember, I would get upset when I had to clean my room as if I was paying rent. Or my mom buy me a video game, but she said I can't play it because I didn't do well in school. But I get mad at her as if I bought the game. But I told myself, I owe my mom at least, at least 16 years of living rent-free. I know your goal is to have a house. I know your goal is to have a car. I know your goal is to be the man. I know your goal is to start your business. I get it. I understand that. Those weren't my goals. My goals were to pay my mom back. I'm in 16 years of debt. 16 years of debt. That's when I went to college. How many people in debt? And you wouldn't let the people next to you distract you that, by the way, you're not going to know in 10 years. You wouldn't let them distract you from getting an education so that you can go to college for free and take that $200,000 that other, those other people are going to pay and put that on your mom's house or your mom's cell phone bill, at least car note, insurance, something. Every single year for the last five years, I've taken a bill from my mom. Every year. I couldn't do it all at once, but I'm going to take this light bill. I was like, Mom, how much is the light bill? She said about $60. Got it. At this point, I'm working at the Cheesecake Factory. And at the Cheesecake Factory, I started my clothing brand called Sleep is for Suckers. And it's geared towards entrepreneurship, people that lose sleep doing what they love. And I realized I can have an idea, put it on a T-shirt, and I can make money from the T-shirt. Watch this. How many people have a job making less than $10 an hour? Let's just say you make $10 an hour. How many hours a week you work? Yeah, a week. About 25 Let's just round it up to 30. Let's say you work 30 hours a week at $10 an hour. How much is that a week? About 300. Minus tax is 250 maybe, right? I started to put this stuff together. The stuff I learned in math class, just understanding numbers, multiplication, division. It's crazy. I realized it's going to take me $5 to make a T-shirt that I could sell for 25 And if I had a $25 T-shirt, if I sell 10 of them, how much is that? About the same as somebody's going to make $10 an hour working 30 hours a week. 
At that point, that's when I realized I can't work fast food. I can't. At, at that point, I realized you really can't pay me because a, a job is going, a job will take care of me, but a job isn't going to take care of me and my mom. So I realized if I can sell 10 shirts a week, that's $250, the same I would be making at my job. And if I did it in five days, how many shirts do I have to sell every day? At least two. You mean to tell me if I sell two shirts every single day for five days, I can make $250, the same amount of money I make, making $10 an hour for 30 hours a week. But let me ask you, in a day, if you had a really cool t-shirt brand, how many would you sell? How many do you think you could sell? I'm talking about if you gave your dream or your mom's financial success or your mom's dream, if you gave your mom's dream the same attention, time, energy, at least at five hours a day that you work at a job, how many shirts could you sell at five, in five hours? Do you all understand why I really couldn't work a job? And this is what I picked up in math class. Like, I'm understanding the numbers. Okay, five, 25 times, if there's two a day, that's 50 times five, that's 250. I can make that. Can anybody do that? This is what I'm going to ask you to do. And I'm, I'm wrapping up. I wrote a book. This is my second book. Give me a round of applause for my second book. Um, it's only 7,500 words in here. And all I did was write a bunch of stuff you shouldn't do at a networking event. It's not. So one of them is uh, fix your cracked screen because you look irresponsible. Who knows they need to fix their cracked screen? Like, like as, a, as a business person, right? You shouldn't give somebody your phone if you've got a cracked screen. I'm telling people what they already know, but I'm going to sell this for $15 a piece. $15 a piece. I can sell 10 of these a week with my eyes closed, an extra $150 a week. That's $600 a month. What can my mom get with $600 a month? What kind of car? But you know you could do this, right? You know you could do this? I'm just trying to encourage you as I wrap up. Um, I, again, I have a learning disability, so none of you guys have an excuse. How many people in their right mind? How many people can do it if they applied themselves? I promise you, I ain't do nothing that you can't do, okay? So take notes. If you don't take anything from this presentation, I'm just asking you to take one or two things and take it with you outside of here because most of the people are going to forget everything they heard here. Okay, just take one or two and take that with you for the rest of your life. Okay? All right, you have a good one. All right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Real quick, we got about 10, 15 more minutes. We're just going to open up for questions. You can either say you have a question for me or a question for jurors, however you want to do it. All right, so real quick, questions, questions before we go. Questions. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. You can get a pick. Yep. Oh, real quick, for those of you who, jurors, um, for those of you who do Instagram, um, I'm E.T. the Hip Hop Preacher on Instagram. Uh, so you can follow us. I put out uh, a daily motivation. All right. So I put out a daily mo. Grab it. Yep. I put out a daily motivation. Oh, we're going to do it like that. <laughs> oh, great. Got it. All right. Um, so make sure, for those of you who need inspiration, every day, we're putting some out every day. Yes, sir. I see you. Yeah, if you follow me, I'll be back. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If you follow me, I'll follow you. Right. Right. Follow me right now. Once I get in the whip, I'll respond to everybody. Get you back or DM me. All right, who's got the next question? Yeah, get it from him. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I will. I, I can't follow you right now. No, I can't. I'm talking right now. 
All right, what's the question? For my man right here. Get it for my man. All right, who's next? Yeah. Oh, you've been following me too. But I didn't know you since 2015. So DM me right now then. I DM me right now. I'll follow you back. He talking about you've been following me since 2015. I didn't even know you was following me. Yeah. That was actually a statement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My man was serious, like, follow me back. I've been following you since 215. I'm like, I ain't even know, bro. <laughs> All the negative energy. I didn't know. <laughs> Talk to me. Yep. The great story, yep. Yep. Yeah, I know that story. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So he's asking the origin of really the video that blew me up. So it's probably got over 100,000 hits. So people like LeBron used it. He, he says in Sports Illustrated to kind of catapult them to win their first title. You know, um, a lot of different people have used it. Actually, that story came from reading. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's in Dennis Kimbrough's book. If I'm not mistaken, it's in his first book, Think and Grow Rich. Here's the crazy part. When you read a lot, I didn't even plan to say that. But like when you put it in, at the right time, this is going to come back out, right? So I never planned to do that presentation. So I read the book, like, for years. I've been, like, I read it for about three or four years in a row. And I just spit it out when it was showtime. So, um, so yeah, yep, that's how it came about, just by reading and studying. So one of the keys to success, the one thing Warren Buffett talked about when I was in that room with him was the fact that he reads six hours a day. He said he reads six hours a day. And he made mention of the fact that he was reading – a financial report from General Motors back in 1956. And I was thinking to myself, why would you be reading something from 1956? But his point was that was a good year for GM. And so if it worked in 1956, there's no reason why in 19, I mean, what was it? 2000 and maybe 17, I, I met with him, 18, I don't remember. But he talked about how much he read. And so a lot of successful people are readers. So I would, I would suggest that, and if you don't like to read, Listen to the audio book. I've got three books out. Like I said, The Secret to Success is an, uh, I wrote it, but it's also an audio book. And then my last book, Average Skill, Phenomenal Will, is also an audio book. So for those of you who don't like to read, I just did it in my voice so that, so that you can listen to it and still get the same content. So if you don't like to read, at least listen to the books on an uh, audio book. Yep. 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 Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, no question. The biggest one, though, is when I got the, so the four-year degree was the biggest one. The GD was okay. But when I got my four-year degree and see my mom smile, she literally drove 776 miles from Michigan to Alabama. And then when I got my master's degree, she came to Michigan State, which only 76. And when I got my PhD, you have to defend, like you're in a room with your, with your uh, committee. My mom was in that room when they said I passed. So the greatest feelings have been just every time I got a degree, just seeing my mama smile. So definitely biggest, biggest moments of my life. Yep. Making mom proud. Good question. When do I plan on retiring? Man, he trying to put me, he trying to make me put the jersey up already. Um, I'll be honest, we got something called Game Changers, and we're actually training speakers. So my, my hope, like Inky Johnson is one of the guys, jurors, we got Jeremy, that's a lot of them. So I'm hoping in the next maybe 10 years. Now, that's, a, that's deep that you ask, because actually what I'm doing, I work six weeks, and I take off a week. So I'm actually, this is my first year of, like, 
literally starting to put myself in that rest mode so that hopefully four or five years from now, like you said, I can just do it every now and then. But uh, until, you know, until, man, the Lord, you know what I'm saying, tells me to relax, I'm going to keep being faithful. You know, I'm going to keep being faithful. Pray for me too, though, all right? Because, like, when you're putting out a video every day and you're putting out content, it's hard to come up with content, fresh content that people like regularly. So just pray that, you know, I get that, keep that anointing, that fresh anointing where I can keep putting it out and young people can use it, you know what I'm saying, to change their lives. Yes, ma'am. I always get nervous because if you listen to me, it's going to change your life. If you don't, somebody in here is, like, not listening. And somebody, unfortunately, I hope it doesn't happen, but somebody's going to end up going to prison. You feel me? I meet kids all the time who were at the schools I were at, not in prison. And they're like, hey, E.T., can I get your book? I was like, yo, you was, one, you was the main one paying, you weren't paying attention. You know, but now in prison, they like, let's go. So um, my, my hope is some of us are knuckleheads. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I got folks talking while I'm talking. It's just some people that's just knuckleheads. They're going to do what they're going to do. So I always get nervous because if I'm talking, let's say I, when I went and spoke to Kyrie Irving. When I, when I spoke for the Cavs, Kyrie ain't, he rich. So if he listened to me or not, he's straight. If you don't listen, like, y'all are not straight. You feel me? Like, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, for real, I'm talking to Alabama. Them boys either going to get a four-year degree or they're going to the NFL. You, that's not going to necessarily happen. So for me, I always get nervous when I'm talking to black students because black students are the only, now, now you got to do me a favor, though. I said, I said you was talking, and you're going to play me, and you're going to keep talking. So I, I, I gave you a warning first. I said it without I said it without saying it. And then you're gonna disrespect me and keep talking. See, this is the problem I have when I come to African American schools. It's like on some silly stuff. So my man sitting right in front of me. That's some silly stuff. When you go to church, your grandma teach you sit down. You don't talk while the pra- pastor's talking. You don't move, you don't walk around while the pastor's talking. That's stuff that you know. You understand? So I don't need no principal or nobody to check you. You mine. Y'all mine. We come from the same place. Don't be disrespectful. If somebody's presenting, if you have something to say, you raise your hand, you address it. But don't talk while people are talking. Because I'm going to give you a pass. But you're going to go somewhere else, and they're not going to give you a pass. They're not going to show you no love. They're not going to show you no grace. They're going to judge you. And as a result of judging you, they're not going to give you certain opportunities. So if you have to talk while somebody's talking, you're not mature enough to be quiet. Just excuse yourself. But don't give yourself a bad name. Like, you might have to see me again. You might have to see me again. I might have to give you a job or a recommendation, whatever. So whatever you do, always be respectful. I saw a young lady. Yes, ma'am. Let's see. Let's see. Here's the deal. We all, my wife got diagnosed with MS. If there's ever a time she needed me to be strong, she needed me to be strong when she was weak. You understand what I'm saying? So in tough times, that's where we really need to be strong. We don't need to be strong when, when, the, when it's 80 degrees outside, the sun is shining. We don't need to be strong. We need to be strong when there's a storm because everybody can be strong when everything is going great. The greats rise like the eagles. They actually use the storm to fly. Like they don't flap their wings. They get in the storm, and they let the storm push them. So it's, you, you have to say to yourself, what's my goal? And then you push through whatever to get to that goal. The people who don't push through are people who don't have goals. But for those of us that have goals, so why am I motivated? My wife, I don't ever want to have to work again. So I do what I do. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I grind so my kids never had to pay. They never took out a student loan. They don't know what a student loan is. You understand? They came, they, they came into this world blessed because I'm doing what I'm supposed to. So I think about them every day. Like, E, keep going. Keep grinding. Your daughter needs you. Your son needs you. So if you have a goal, your goal will push through. Let me give you an example. My mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer 10 years ago, metastasized throughout her whole body. They sent her home and said, you got four or five months to live. And my mother-in-law said, my wife is her only child, and she was never married. She wanted to see her grandkids graduate from high school. She said, I will not die until my babies graduate from high school. And my son graduated from high school. My daughter graduated from high school. Ten years later, my son graduated from college. She went, and she said, well, since I saw him go to college, I'm going to see my granddaughter go to college. So she willed her way through it because she had a goal. As long as we have a goal, 
There's nothing that can stop us from making that goal become a reality. You got it? Yes, ma'am. So, so you become a motivational speaker first by being motivational. Like you have to be positive. So people have to look at you as a sense of positivity and a sense of energy. And then you got to study because you can't talk about what you don't know. Right. So you got to start journaling your experiences, journaling the experiences of others, writing stuff down, listen to music, you know, and saying, OK, this I, I think if I say it this way, they're going to love it because that's what rap is all about. You know, what I'm saying like Cardi B is who she is just because of the way she says stuff like for real. I'm, I'm not necessarily a new hip hop fan, but somebody like Cardi B blew up because she said it. She's like, yo, I got a bag and I fix my teeth. You know, what I'm saying like everybody else fixes their teeth, faking it like they ain't fix their teeth. I'm like, bro, I saw the movie. Your teeth didn't look like that. In New Jack City, you had those teeth, but you're trying to fake it like Cardi B letting you know, like fl flat out, like I got my teeth done. You know what I'm saying? So the way she says what she says, it's like catchy. It's nothing new. It's nothing we never heard of before. But the way she phrases things makes us go like, wow, I can understand that. That's, you know, whatever. Right. So as a speaker, you got to how do I say things? How do I get their attention? How do I? But if you're a female, can I be real? The game is. How many, number one, like the game is open. It's wide open. It's just like rap for females. The motivational speaker game for women is wide open. So they, they need more women and they need more people like you who have a real experience to talk. Good, talk to me. And then cut me off because I know we got time. Here and then here. They're, they're making me go back there. Yes, ma'am. My wife, I didn't really talk to pastor that much, but watch this. This is how good God is. My freshman year, he came on campus. He did a week of prayer. Unbelievable. He baptized, I think, 250 kids. So he was there for one week, like the first month or so that I was in school, he was there for a whole week. So we chopped it up while I was there. It was kind of giving me the energy. And then my fiance, um, yeah, we were freshmen together. We took class together, whatever. But we got married, I told you, after my freshman year. So once we got married, she put her foot, she a gorilla, she put her foot like, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. Because we married now, and my, your success is my success. So sister girl used to push me all the time, like, oh, so you're a speaker, huh? Where are your business cards? Where's your website? Oh, you're a speaker, huh? Are you re registered with the local, um, you know, black, you know, commerce, like are, are you chamber of commerce? Like, are you serious? So yeah, sister girl been pushing me. Pastor, not so much, but sister girl been pushing me my whole life. And unfortunately, my pastor, uh, he's probably in his 70s. He just passed four months ago of stomach cancer. So we laid him to rest. And I was blessed. His granddaughter is now in college, and they couldn't afford to send her. So I was able to do for her what her granddaddy did for me. And I was able to send her to the college that he and I both went to in Huntsville, Alabama. So absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, we'll take one or two more. I know y'all got to get out of here. So boom, boom, boom. All right, ladies first. Oh, wow. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When my wife was diagnosed with MS, we went to a naturalist. So we didn't, you know, of course, we went to a normal doctor that gives you, you know, that the medication, if you will. But then we went to a naturalist in California to find out if there were some natural remedies we could take. And so one of the things he said to my wife, he gave her a document and said, one of the ways you're going to overcome this and not let it destroy you is you have to be mentally strong. So I'm going to give you a decree. And that decree he gave us says, I can, I will, I must. And that's where I got that from. So after we left that hospital, I started saying it to my wife daily. I can, I will, I must. I can, I will, I must. And then when I started speaking, I just, you know, it just, it was so in my spirit that I just started giving it to the world and people start responding to it. The way he said that my wife would, just people in the audience start responding to it the same way. But nobody's ever asked me that. Great question. Great question. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was hurt, bro. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to be real with you. I didn't change my ways, but you know how some, you know, you got a conscience. You feel me? Like, I don't care what you're doing. You know right from wrong. And I was hurt. Like, wow, why would my mom, not why would she say it? I know why she said it. But I was like, yo, E, what did you do to get your mom to that point? And I had made up in my mind that day, I'm going to make my mother proud of me. Like, I'm going to turn this around. You feel me? Like, I can't do nothing right now. 
but I'm going to turn this thing around. And I think that day gave me the motivation to push through all the stuff in the streets, not get caught up selling dope, not get caught all that stuff that my boys was doing. I, I, can't, I had one foot in, but I had one foot out and was always like going to church and just trying to do the right thing. And I was able to get out of that situation. And like I said, man, my mom traveled. She like, she can't believe. She'd been in Australia with me. She'd been to London with me. She like, just can't believe how everything got turned around. And then I helped moms. She just wrote her first book. So I paid 23 grand to help her get her first book published, bought 10,000 copies. She traveled and selling her book. So yeah, I put the icing on the cake. You know what I'm saying? Put the cherry on the cake with helping my mom write her book. So I'm telling y'all, all these people y'all trying to impress, it should be the first person you should be trying to impress is who? Good. That's number one. Now, we can debate if number two is your daddy or not, all right? That's a debate in our community. But if your father's in your life, honor your mother and father, okay? Honor your mother and father. How many of y'all got grandmas that are still in your life? Let me see. So you should be trying to honor who? And can I say this to you guys? I can't ever get this back. Each one of you in this room, your parents and loved ones, deserve to see you walk across the stage. If you don't do nothing else, they deserve to be sitting in the audience. Do we do it here? No, where do we do it? The arena. So your mama deserved to be in the arena. When they say your name, she deserves to put that smile on her face. She deserved to go to the beautician and get her hair. She deserved to go get a new dress. For real, she deserved to go out to eat afterwards and tell everybody, my baby graduated from college. And I'm going to tell you all as a father, one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life was seeing my son graduate from high school and graduate from Michigan State. And my daughter graduated from high school, and now she's about to graduate from Michigan State. And we're starting a new cycle in my family. We're no longer high school dropouts. We graduate from high school, and we go to college, and we entrepreneurs. It's a whole, it's a new sheriff in town. It's a new sheriff in town, and I dare y'all to break the cycles in your life. How many of y'all got negative cycles that need to be broken in your life? Let me see your hand. Be honest. Got some negative cycles. How many of you are going to take ownership and say, my parents maybe didn't have the opportunity to do it, or the generation before didn't have the opportunity to do it, but we're about to start winning in our family. All we do is win. Come on. From this point forth, all we do is win. No matter. Come on. All we do is no matter. Good. How many of y'all want to be winners? Let me see your hand. How many of y'all want to be blessed financially? Let me see your hand. How many of y'all want to be in great relationships, have great families? Let me see your hand. Who's stopping you from doing it? Nobody. I love you guys. Take care and make the rest of your life the best of your life, guys.